All right, the Committee on Finance and Law will come to order. Calling the roll, Dr. DeMello. Present. Mr. Fiore is present, and Mr. Enos is absent. Our first item is uh, use of facilities memorandum. Motion to receive and place on file. Chair seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. All those opposed, so voted. Um, next, uh, the uh, report on the legal services for special education uh, notes that there is a charge to um, August 2023 in the amount of $928. And uh, that means that year to date from July 1st is $1,357.90. Uh, motion uh, to receive and place on file with uh, just a quick discussion. So sure. uh, ju just maybe this is just a simple math problem, but the balance 50,000 now at 49,571 and we have over 2,200 or 2,200 and change in expenses. So we may want to adjust that legal balance f moving forward. I think the 1357 is June and August. So it's July and August, excuse me. July and August, sorry. That's right. Two months. But even if you take 13 out of 50,000, it's, it's still 48 and change. Just just for future records. So if we just note that, mm -hmm. that what we're receiving, there will be an amendment to the balance. Mr. Chairman. So noted. Forty-eight. Uh, Forty-eight six four three. Six four three. <coughs> Wonderful. All right. Uh, next item are uh, updates uh, on the. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I don't think we. I uh, just oh, like the motion to, to the vote. The vote on the. Yeah. All those in favor. Aye. Chair votes aye. All those opposed, so voted. All right, um, <clears throat> the next item, uh, the updates on the uh, various accounts for the first quarter. Mrs. Moynihan. Thank you, Mr. Fiore. The first one is <laughs> our line item budget, which will go for quarter one um, from ending in September 2023. As you can see, each line item has their appropriation, how much we have spent thus far in the first quarter the balance for each line, and then the percentage expended. And again, if you go all the way to the bottom, again, that's going to be the total for each one of the columns. And as you can see, we've expended about 9.38% of our budget, which again, that's a little bit, a little bit um, smaller than a quarter. So we look to be um, right on target with our budget. There are some lines that are higher than um, over 100%. And those lines would be maybe one-time purchases. And we don't usually see those items going on um, continuous purchases. So we will go ahead and monitor those large, larger lines and, and um, if needed, make some adjustments. I have a question. Mr. Cabral. I'm not, I'm not sure if you have this information, but the 9.38% compared to where we were last year at this point, is it in line or out of line? We're actually lower than we were last lower year. We, were, we last year? were last year, yes. Thank you. I believe we were at 14%. I, I think we were 14%. Yes, at the left. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what could that be attributed to? We have a lot of grant funded as well that we're able to um, to charge to right now. So we want to make sure that we are using all of our grant funding before the end of the, the grant due date. Sure. Well, excellent. Thank you. The next one, do you want to do each one or are we doing all at once? Well, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. The next one is our revolving account, again, for quarter one through September 2023. The beginning balance for all of the line items, which began in July um, 1st, is $4.6 million. In that quarter one, we received $732,000 in revenue. We've encumbered $25,000, and that $25,000 encumbrance is, um, is going to be given to or um, going to be spent towards ADA um, upgrades, and that has just been completed at Bennett Elementary for the playground. So that will be coming out probably for the next quarter. We've expended $179,000 with a balance of our revolving accounts of $5.1 million. 
So Excellent. So it looks like we're on pace to end the year with about six million in the volume. So when we meet with long range planning, uh, we, I, this is Morning mm -hmm. and Mr. Freitas and myself, we'll be making a recommendation to tackle one of the athletic uh, facility items. We talked about mm -hmm. the dual softball field or address the softball field. So that'll be a recommendation when we go to long range planning. That'll be excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one is um, our grants update. Again, through quarter um, quarter one, you will see the fiscal year 2022. We do have some grants that have a grant balance, but again, they will see the <coughs> end date it is not ending until 2024. Um, there are other grants that are new to the district, which are the ones that are at, have an asterisk. So again, each one will have the name of the grant, the grant manager, the purpose, the start date, the end date of the grant, the award amount, how much we've expended, and then the grant balance. If you look at each one of the lines, as you can see, um, right now for FY22 grant funds, we still have a balance of $9.5 million, again, in line with when the due dates are, so we will be expending all of it. FY23 grants, we have a grant balance of $1.6 million. FY24 grants, we've been awarded this year of $4.8 million and we have not expended any of that money, which totals our balance of $30.5 million, $30 million in awarding of grants, with our grant balance currently at $16 million. Please know that I do work with a grant manager, and uh, um, our grant managers and our director of grants with continuous updates to make sure that we are using our grant funding and making sure that we expend all grant funding before the due dates. Excellent. Mr. Chairman, just a quick comment. So, uh, Mrs. Monahan, just to confirm on this report, <laughs> the only one I see that's coming up 1231 2023 is the 305 Title I with 14933.50. Is that correct? The only one coming up in 23? The one that's only coming up in 23? That's due, I should say, by 12. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. No. 23s are the, I'm sorry, which one are you referring uh, to? Line uh, 305 Title I. The, the Title I grants, and just so you know, the Title I grants usually are carried over for another six to 12 months. That's considered to be one Title um, Title I is always considered a rollover grant. Right, and it's such a small balance anyway, so on the $15,000, so that I'm sure. That can be expended very quickly. Exactly, so that's good. I was very fearful of that 1231-23 uh, day for some reason. I think I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about that, but I see a lot of 1231s 24, 25, and 26. Correct. So the that title, gives us- The title one always goes on, so right, you know right. you're gonna but get I'm, I'm glad there. that you know we're not <coughs> rushed to judgment and we make sound judgment decisions as a committee, so it's <coughs> great. And also, too, to keep in mind, correct me if I'm wrong, that as long as these funds are encumbered, Compliance Absolutely. So if they're incumbent with a PO that we know that we are waiting mm -hmm. and anticipating a, a product, we are in, a, in um, alignment with the grant. Beautiful. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, a motion to receive all three of these reports, the Appropriation Quarter 1 report, Revolving Account Quarter 1 report, and the Grants Quarter 1 report, receive and place on file. Chair seconds. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all the things think by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. All those opposed, so voted. Then we have two bills payable warrants. Uh, first for fiscal year 23 in the amount of $30,315.70. Motion to approve in the amount <coughs> stated. Chair seconds, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, all those opposed, so voted. And for fiscal 24, $947,450.47. Motion to approve in the amount stated. Chair seconds. Any discussion? Hear none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, all those opposed so voted. And finally, facilities update, Mrs. Moynihan. Facilities update that's <coughs> been provided by our Director of Facilities, Mark Freitas. Um, again, he provides us uh, monthly reports. This report that he is providing us here is from July 1st through October 13th with a total work orders of 770 items. These within the 770 work items, Taunton Public Schools occupied 75% of those work orders which resulted in 595 work orders um, at, within all of the 58 buildings for the, uh, the city of Taunton. So again, that is a quick little snapshot. You can also see at the bottom how many are per building, what are open, and which um, orders are, are still are closed as well. 
Mr. Chairman, motion to receive in place all five. I do have one discussion point. Okay, uh, 10, 10 uh, seconds, I, go ahead. I know that we rave about our facilities and how state-of-the-art <laughs> they are and they're top notch <clears throat> across the state. Uh, and, and these are quite a few orders. Do we need extra personnel to assist Mr. Freitas in any way? What these work orders are usually are going to the building, the city building department. So they have to go ahead and do the plumbing. They do um, any plumbing, any electrical, things like that. So they, that is something that the, bill, the city department must so do. So he has some help. Okay, yeah. great. And the reason why I, I asked Mrs. Monaghan through Mr. Freitas to generate this report is we want to make sure we're getting our 75% NESCO spending share of the building department that we get assessed. Wonderful. So if there's a dip, if there's an increase, Suggested. Great. Thank I mean, you. For many, for many years, there was a problem with accessing the building department because at one time um, the building commissioner oversaw both the city buildings and the inspectional services and just couldn't de devote enough time to supervising crews. Mm. Uh, then they, back uh, about uh, a little over 18 years ago, I guess now, they uh, they finally added the, the, the second position that uh, supervises just the buildings and not, not, uh, not as involved with, with inspections, and that's made a big difference. Sure. <coughs> I did second it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed, so voted. Motion to adjourn. Chair seconds. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed, so voted. Thank you. The uh, second regular meeting of uh, October for the Taunt School Commission come to order. Please uh, rise for the pledge and the national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in still there oh say does that star spangled then I yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave please remain standing Mrs. Fagan Lord, as we begin this session, let us acknowledge your goodness and mercy and ask your blessings on all our deliberations. We thank you for this opportunity to be of service to the, our community and to the young people entrusted to our care. Mrs. Fagan, please. Yes, and we're asking for a moment of silence tonight. Uh, Dr. DeMello reached out to Rabbi Coleman Reboy of Congregation Akudath Akim to let him know that a scheduled school committee meeting prevented us from attending a vigil for the people of Israel. Rabbi Reboy was appreciative for the prayers, thoughts, and compassion that was given to his congregation from our community. In keeping with the spirit of our community, I ask for a moment of silence for the people of Israel who were killed, maimed, or captured in the attack on their country. We also want to recognize the hundreds of innocent people of every race, ethnicity, or creed from many different countries, including those in the Middle East, who lost their lives by virtue of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. As we are all God's children, let us also pray for peace in our world by putting aside our differences to make our world a better place. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all those who lost family and friends. And a moment of silence now.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary Fagan. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Pulowski. Present. Mr. Fiore. Present. Mrs. Fagan is present. Mr. Vieira. Present. Mr. George. Present. Mr. Laura. Present. Oh, I'm sorry, and Mr. Enos is absent, <coughs> and Chairman DeMello. Present. Uh, approval of the minutes of September 20, 2023. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Next up, we have the Student Advisory Committee with us tonight. We have Natalie Duncan. Welcome once again. Hi, my name is Natalie Duncan, and I'm a member of the Student Advisory Committee. Over the weekend, the juniors took the PSATs. This was the first time the PSATs were digital, and it went very well. Our very own Taunton High senior, Liam Scully, is a National Merit Scholar semifinalist. The class of 2025 is wrapping up our officer elections, and we will have a fully formed board soon. Also, progress check reports came out last night. We have a home football game on Friday where a German broadcasting company will be present. They will be gathering information about how New England football fans celebrate football. Students who took the refereeing class at Taunton High are now officially refereeing and making money while doing it. We even had students ref away games in Franklin. Representatives from Northeastern came to deliver an anti-bullying seminar to a group of sophomores and juniors. Two groups of students will be putting on presentations in front of faculty on November 1st as a way to promote students' voices and practice speaking in front of large groups. One group will be talking about why students should be able to wear hats during Spirit Week and how students and teachers can treat each other with respect, while the other group will be talking about our mentoring club, Tigers Together. The College and Career Center in the library is expanding as well. Finally, we will begin experimenting with grab-and-go style breakfast in the morning to make getting breakfast more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. So it appears that everything's uh, on a steady pace. Yeah. Good. How's your year doing? It's going good. Yeah. Good. Thank you for sharing. Any uh, comments from the committee? Questions, comments? Don't leave yet. <laughs> None? Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Uh, next up, we have public input. Secretary Fagan. Yes. In accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapters 39, Section 23C, we kindly request that individuals wishing to provide public input sign up in advance. A copy of the regulation and guidelines will be provided upon sign up, and individuals be asked to state their name and address for the record. The amount of time each registered individual will have to speak will be determined by the number of people who sign the register and will be announced prior to the start of the public portion, uh, public input portion of the meeting. Thank you, Mrs. Fagan. Uh, any public input tonight, Mr. There's no public input. No this public meeting. input. Thank you. Next up, we have the Tom Public Schools multilingual program update. Uh, we had expected Ms. Delilah Mendonza, who's under the weather, I believe, but we will have a presentation by Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Chris Barada, and it's the um, coming up on the slideshow. Thank you. So as Mr. Barada is waiting for the laptop and the projector to reboot, one of our goals this year at there in the all admin retreat was for each administrator, each department, each building, each principal to develop <coughs> three multilingual goals. So we are very proud of the work that uh, Mrs. Mendoza is taking on or leading in her department. And she, Mrs. Mendoza is a direct report to Mr. Barada, so we thought it would be only fitting in her absence that Mr. Barada would present her hard work and share with the committee you know, the work that we are doing to welcome our newcomers, but also to provide them with a well-rounded education. Thank you, Superintendent Cabral. <clears throat> As the superintendent mentioned, uh, Ms. Mendoza is extremely powerful and passionate about the area of supporting multilingual students, in fact, all students. And if she were here, she would compliment her team of multilingual educators, along with those teachers that, uh, that appreciate their presence and support the students throughout all the classrooms. So this first slide represents Ms. Mendoza's and her departments and the district's why. We have students who come from five of the seven continents <laughs> on this world. And those countries that are illuminated in color there represent where our students come from. It's important to know that you look, the United States, and then by virtue of the 50th state of Alaska, we have a lot of multilingual students who are born in the United States, not just we take them in. And it's also important to know that the Taunton Public School District has been supporting students with limited or no English proficiency for over 40 years. 
So this work isn't new. It has evolved over the number of the years and looks different than it did 40 years ago. However, it's a work that continued and it's very much needed. Now, who are we? The district now supports 701 multilingual students who qualify for direct services on an ongoing basis. In addition to those 701 multilingual students, we have 197 former English learners, which is called FELs, that they have to continue to monitor for four more years. That represents 17 languages that we support primarily in the district, with the four highest being Spanish, Portuguese, and I should put these in order, and I apologize, Portuguese, Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Cape Verdean. 231 of those are US born. When we talked about they actually come from our country here in the work. So in essence, we support over 800 students in monitor. So those 197 students are those students who maybe came in with limited proficiency or came through our Newcomers Academy and they're out away from the Newcomer Academy. For the next four years, we have to monitor to see their success. And if they struggle or need more support, they may be pulled back in. So it's a large number of students that are represented here in the work of that department. The multilingual pr program builds upon eight pillars. Just again, it reinforces the whole program. The first thing has to do with, and most importantly, the development of metalingu metalinguist awareness through contrastive analysis, language connections. What that really means is meta, large scale, linguistic, looking at the language and the awareness and actually thinking about how the language instruction looks like, how the language is structured. And through this contrastive analysis, you actually look at what the child knows in their native language and what they have to know in English and then trying to build that bridge. So it's a lot of thought process on the part of the educator identifying what the student is capable of doing in their own language, understanding and knowing what they have to learn in the English language, and then bridging that gap. Obviously, through that hard work, access to our grade level standards, which all of our students, regardless of identity, have to do, rigorous learning environments and activities, oral language development, the speaking component, literacy, using grade level texts, scaffolding for various needs. Obviously, we talked about 17 different languages, servicing a whole continuum of learning of uh, abilities of students. Our educators have to scaffold those supports to support those children. And obviously using effective assessment tools, including student self-assessment. Where do they view their own learning? Just much like in November, we'll talk about, say, the CELIS data, where students reflect upon their own mental health needs and areas that they feel confident in, or areas that might disclose where they need uh, supports. Our multilingual learners will also self-assess of where they feel their skill set is. And obviously, the social justice themes all tie together in supporting uh, our students. Now the programs that we have here. All educators are required to attain their SEI endorsement upon certification, which means for sheltered English emerging, uh, immersion competency points in PDPs. All right, that's grades one through 12. How do we support our students? <coughs> our newcomers academy, think of it as your spine that run from elementary, middle, and high school. We support students at the elementary level, specifically here at EPOL, in three classrooms, a grade one, two combination, a grade two, three, a grade three, four. So the educator will actually teach across grade level standards, using differentiated instruction where necessary, and then pulling them together with those common skills that are needed on both levels. At the middle school level, the newcomer is located at Parker, services grades five through seven. We actually have two educators there a humanities teacher who will teach ELA and social studies, English language arts and social studies, and STEM, math and science. So those students, the newcomers academy, revolve around those two educators. At the elementary level, they have one classroom teacher. And at the eighth grade, we have additional eighth grade support in their academy, and at the high school level, outside of that, uh, Director D uh, Mendoza, actively pursued, duly certified instructors, educators, not only in multilingual, but also in the content areas, English, math, history. The greatest leverage we can have is ELL, 
instructors in the mainstream classrooms directly with content because then there's no mistaking of it. You're actually working on the language of the, the content itself. And of course, we also have the co-teaching models, specifically in science, where we have the English language learner uh, instructor working hand in hand with the biology teacher. And again, when you think about that, we say, well, wait a minute, a multilingual learner, here's someone who speaks you know, Haitian Creole or Spanish. Well, just like that student goes into another room, you have the language of English, language arts. You have the, the language of mathematics. You have the language of science, all new to everyone. And the strategies that our multilingual educators use to support our multilingual language students works for all students because they all get dropped into that domain of others speaking of what is a math language, what is the science, the language involved in science and such. It's important to know that we talk to our students and our children as we you know, raise them. It's, not, it's important not only you behave and you act in a proper manner of when I'm in your presence, but how do you act when you're not around adults? This slide really represents the work that Taunton has done independent of any outside eyes looking at us. And then when they have come in and examined us, really looked at what the, our multilingual department has done independently. For example, this past August, uh, we presented to the new e, uh, English language learners, world language leaders in the state of Massachusetts alongside DESE to speak about using the tiered focus monitoring process to improve the programming outcomes and equitable access to ELs. Every, I think it's five to six years, every district undergoes a tiered focus monitoring where they look at a lot of indicators. This past one, we went to the special needs, but also the multilingual learners. When they came and evaluated, the multilingual department, they were amazed at how progressive that department was in instilling systems in place to not only support the students, which is our main focus, but also our educators. We were recognized in doing so well that the team went out and presented what we did here at Taunton to DESE and such. This past September, uh, again, highlighted our work at Taunton High School and redesigning the schedule to meet the needs of ELS. Again, working hand in hand with the high school and this committee here that actually agreed to the schedule uh, reconfiguration, working hand in hand with Ms. Mendoza and her educators, making sure that the multilingual students were scheduled first as a priority and then built the rest of the schedule around them, making sure they had total access to the programs that they needed. And also to share the work that we've done in Taunton to redesign the high school schedule by strengthening supports and newcomers, building a true co-teaching, duly licensed model. That is extremely difficult, and we've just made headway in it finding duly certified instructors in the co-teaching model. That's very difficult when you actually think about when we're looking at developing and sustaining co-teaching models for special educators. It's even more difficult for multilingual learners in the co-teaching model, finding qualified instructors, and Ms. Mendoza, along with the H depart HR department, has done a tremendous job of calling applicants and then vetting them to place them in our school to support our students. This slide deck here just shows you the comparison of what our district and what our district enrollment numbers look like as compared to the state. And the state is obviously the red line above. Taunton is in the blue line, and you'll notice an uptick between uh, the 2021 2022 year and the 2022 and 2023 year. That somewhat mirrors the state. We're no means larger than the state, but it shows that we're reflective of what is taking place across uh, the Massachusetts Commonwealth. And on the right hand side, uh, examines the number of students tested in which they take the access testing. If you notice the numbers, 2019, we tested 420 students. This past year, because this is lag data, was 579 students tested. It shows you an increase of over 100 and some odd students were testing. Now, who wants to ask the question of what does the gray mean, where it has 60? Oh, thanks for asking, Ms. Moynihan. The 60 in 2021, we did a phenomenal job, and I want to credit Ms. Mendoza, her educators, the community facilitators, her secretary, Helen Laura, Maeva Call, who's a, the assessment for ELS, of reaching out to families saying, look, you've worked so hard, we need you in school to test. And they show up, and the children show up. When you talk about participation rates, it's almost 100% with the exception of 2021 year, 
which was actually the spring of 2020. So that in the throes of COVID, the state still said you must test using the access platform. Those 60 students, their families chose not to send their school, their children to the school. Obviously we didn't penalize, we didn't say we understood that, but that's just an anomaly we just wanted to actually point out to you that yes, we missed 60 students for testing, but obviously it was the parents didn't feel comfortable having their children come in during that period to test. Now, our progress towards English language proficiency. The number of students, and this is again last year's data, we haven't got the reports for this year yet, the number of students who improved, or students increased their level, 285 of our students improved on their testing. 27 students stayed the same. We did see a decrease of 114 students not performing as well. Now, there's a lot of variables that go into that. You could have students who basically didn't do well on the assessment. We also take in and we found a lot of students um, join our district later in their schooling, say in high school. So they haven't really benefited from the, the rigorous instruction that our educators provide. So when they take the test, they might not have performed as well as they would have if they'd been more time with us. You also look at those numbers that we'll see uh, evidence in other slides. We receive a lot of students, again, some are born right in the United States, some from across seas, right, who have been not enrolled in schooling in their home country. Or it's been disrupted through some traumatic event. Or this may be the third stop of, uh, of country where they've visited other countries, enrolled in their school system, which was another like ours, and trying to catch up with, wait a minute, they might have been in this school system learning this language, now in this, another country doing this language, and now they're here in the United States. So although Ms. Mendoza is somewhat disappointed and wants to dig in deeper in why those 114 didn't do as well, she's extremely uh, elated by the number of 285 who improved uh, their performance. And this bar graph represents basically what was on the other slide about you know, the students who either increased, maintained the same, or actually dropped in levels. So this is a, just a different representation of what was on the preceding slide. Mm -hmm. Can I pause for a second, because I'm speaking really fast, and ask, is there any questions at all? Okay. Mr. Fury? Well, I have a comment to make, because I'm a little interested in one point that you've raised because I had some personal experience with it, and that is talking about actual natural born United States citizens who don't speak English. Um, I had the experience of going to Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, where they speak French in the streets the way you hear Portuguese being spoken in Fall River, New Bedford, for example. And I was doing poll checking in an election, and there were people after people who were voting United States citizens who spoke not a word of English because they had French Catholic churches, they had French Catholic schools, they could get Montreal newspapers, they could get Canadian radio and television, they had uh, local French things. They never needed to learn English. They could uh, get along in that kind of environment. And, uh, we need to be looking at some of the social factors that prevent uh, some of our uh, young people from not learning English earlier and, and need to, to know how to, how to get around them. But I mean, I've observed that myself. I've also read about uh, Lyndon Johnson's election to the United States Senate mm -hmm. from Texas about how there were county after county along the Mexican border, where, again, where nobody spoke English, but they were American citizens born here. And that's a really serious phenomenon that needs more and more study. Thank you, Mr. Fiore. And that goes to, I think it might have been the eighth pillar in the program about um, social justice. Is asking how do we as a district respect the home or a native language spoken in the home and, and agree that they should continue that while they learn English as well? And that's that component of, hey, you have to respect the cultures you come from. And actually, you should foster it and continue it so it doesn't uh, filter out. Mm -hmm. This slide here, I know the school committee, uh, those who sat on either the elementary school improvement plan segments or the secondary, look at the line graphs dealing how our students perform against the state. 
on the left-hand side are English language learners' growth on MCAS. Again, we always want to achieve at high levels. The next step below that is how well our students grow. And in terms of ELA, we actually outperformed the state in the 2023 assessment. And that was reflective of the graph there. We did take a dip in 2021, not as far as the state did. And again, we're exceeding what took place for the state. On mathematics, difficulty where we sort of were above the curve, up until this past year, we slipped a little bit below the state level, and that's the graph that's representative on the right-hand side. Again, more work to be done, but if you talk about, or we mentioned earlier about the language of certain content areas, math is very nuanced, just as much as science, in the language that we use. And if we have a lot of um, discourse, student discourse taking place, the language and the understanding of it is really, really important. So we also wanna look at how does the factor in the, the multilingual experience in learning math and fortunately, the illustrative math uh, curriculum has scaffolds built into it for our multilingual learners. And the more our staff become more familiar with it, the more our students retain that knowledge, we anticipate this, this uh, change in the course of trajectory of student learning. Now, our accountability targets. On the left-hand side are the schools within the district where we have enough, enough student population to qualify as a reporting group. Two schools that are missing from the left-hand side, obviously, are Letty and the Alternative High School. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side is progress towards targets. Now we're looking at students, not versus the state. So for example, the students at Bennett, 78% of the students at Bennett who qualify for multilingual learners met their target. Sixty-one percent of those students at Chamberlain met their target or towards their target, growth towards their target. What you notice, the areas that we need to focus on that Ms. Mendoza has always been on were at the middle school level. You see Friedman is at 22, Martin 22, Parker at 13. And looking at now with the systems in place of how you have duly certified people, more additional supports, we anticipate that this number will go up in the future. Again, not saying it is what it is. They're multilingual learners and that's it. It's okay, what are we going to do about it? Now our focus areas for this year, partnership with Confianza and Ayana Cooper. Confianza is a great resource that Ms. Mendoza been using one, uh, as actually almost a personal coach, as a leader of the multilingual department, but also the supports that she develops in concert with Ms. Mendoza's, how she shares out and works with and coaches her teachers in development. Ayanna Cooper is the guest speaker who spoke at this August's retreat, and she focused on, you know, are we really paying attention to those populations that have been marginalized, their special needs, multilingual learners, and her perspective was really good because her experience is dealing with civil rights violations. Basically saying, here's the things you don't want to do. And she and Ms. Mendoza formed a great relationship because again, once uh, Ms. Mendoza showed her the work we're doing in the district, she was very much impressed, so much so in saying, hey, here's my number, let's keep in contact. So that relationship will continue. We have uh, Ms. Mendoza start up a kindergarten teacher's PLC. Last year we realized kindergarten is a very rich vocabulary environment. And why wouldn't we want our multilingual learners in with their peers? But you just can't push students in and expect our teachers to do yeoman's work and figure it out. She is going to be working with kindergarten teachers to how best support multilingual <coughs> learners in the kindergarten environment. She's uh, also working with the school principals, uh, elementary school principals, in terms of leadership. How can you lead a multilingual friendly school? How do you support your teachers? what to look for in classrooms, and how can we develop a communication system so we're all on the same page. Same with the middle school principals, working as PLC, so really going through the fact of, hey, we're gonna work with leaders, instructional leaders, and on the backside, work with teachers as well, so we make sure all the students are being supported. And of course, we all know that all the administrators on behest of the Superintendent Cabral has identified each principal and must come up with three goals to support our multilingual learners this year. So again, tying in with accountability for all the right reasons. Working on the writing and curriculum development, as we heard earlier tonight with the school improvement plans and across with the district improvement, writing is an extremely focused. I don't want to say it's initiative because it's what good school <coughs> districts do and will continue to do. 
Ms. Uh, Mendoza and her department are also looking at what would be like writing prompts to support her students and how can we improve uh, the written expression of our multilingual students. And then obviously fully supporting the new model at the high school with the, the newcomer supports in eighth grade, but also the duly certified. And what does that co-teaching model look like? So all great systems being rolled out. It's a matter of how do we monitor it? How do we support it? How do we stop and take a look and say, what do we need to adapt and move forward? So great work that we're looking forward to this year. And again, ongoing support. Elevation, so that Elevation is a software package purchased through Title III grants. Elevation will not only feed into um, student performance levels, but actually provides for the educator the strategies necessary to support the students. This platform is so good that special educators and general educators can use that for strategies. When you look and say, I don't know how to support a student who is unable to do this, this program provides you with different menu options in which you can draw upon to support all students. Obviously, professional development during staff meetings, Ms. Mendoza goes out, bridging the gap with principals. Would you like me to come to your curriculum meeting? I can present X, Y, and Z to your staff. So she's active in the building, supporting principals and their teachers. And obviously, she always not only one informs teachers of their 15 PDPs, professional development points, to maintain their SEI endorsement. Uh, a few years back, Ms. Mendoza actually offered classes in SEI so that we could constantly uh, maintain a robust number of students or teachers maintaining their licensure for SEI endorsements. Now you have a lot of uh, colleges and universities providing as well. But that's an ongoing thing of supporting teachers of this is really important work. Uh, because one, our students deserve it, and two, your licenses depend upon it. So that's sort of a uh, good incentive, I guess you'd say. And I believe that's the end of Ms. Bendoza's presentation. I hope I did it justice um, because she will hold me to it, but she's a very proud Tontonian. She went through the schools. She uh, went through the English Language Learner Program. So she knows it not only as a leader, but as a parent and as a former student. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Barada. A very comprehensive uh, slide, slide deck, thank you. I'll open up to the committee and maybe we'll start on this side of the room here. Mr. Polsky. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Barada, for presenting this very detailed presentation and thank you to Mrs. Mendoza. Absolutely. I'm sure is watching from home. Um, yeah, this is this is great. Like this is real. It's really great to see that we're putting this much thoughtful effort in into supporting these kids. That you know they deal with all the same struggles that every kid deals with. But on top of that, mm -hmm. learning multiple languages and having to a access all of this content in more than one language. So it, it's it's really impressive the work that we do, and it and it's ongoing, and and it's really interesting to see how it's evolved over time. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Polsky. Mr. Fury? I've made my comments already. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Mr. Laura. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. A student at an early age at home before, go, before he or she goes to school um, speaks, let's say, Portuguese fluently at home. They begin school. Now they learn in English. Of course, a lot of youth at that age, they pick up languages very quickly, as you well know, and I think you've indicated this in this presentation. But when is it, uh, if a student starts the primary language at home, then goes into a form of assessment to determine what level of language that person should go into, classroom, is that how it works? Okay, so in your scenario, you're saying that a child enrolls in kindergarten coming from a home that speaks only one language, monolingual in their native language. That child would then be in kindergarten, where as we know now that Ms. Mendoza and her department are supporting kindergarten teachers. Again, it's a very rich vocabulary environment for English-speaking students as well, right? And that time is not only on the spot assessments of what's taking place, but also we have a monitoring system where students who enroll in the district who in that initial registration process 
to a, complete a language survey, and that's where my Eva call and our community facilities are phenomenal about. Okay, do we know that uh, there's a native language spoken in the home? They do an assessment right at that point and flag students. Not in a negative way, but saying, hey, we need to monitor because here's someone who's coming in who only spoke Portuguese, right. now in kindergarten. Let's monitor it. Let's look at language acquisition. As time goes on, then they'll look at the assessments and stuff and say, okay, we really may perhaps bring in more supports at that time. Based upon how quickly that student learns the English language, that determines whether that person is going to need a bilingual setting or a multilingual setting throughout his or her educational Right, studies. so our, our newcomer really, there's, there's, there's a, uh, a timeline of three years and you're out of newcomer academy. You can move out of that quicker based upon your, your, the skills that you attain. Your acquisition. Huh? And we mentioned on that first slide we had, what, 700 some odd students that we had multilingual learners and we had 197 former English language students who've moved out of the program that we still continue to monitor. So that might be an example of someone who comes into the program and says, you know what, doesn't qualify for or doesn't seem to need to be in a newcomer academy, but we're going to have to monitor because we know that that student came from a monolingual home. Conversely, if it's a third grader, say here at ePoll, and then scored enough, say, came, say fourth grader, going into middle school. You know what, they've progressed enough. They're going to leave now the newcomer academy. They'll attend Parker because it's a neighborhood school, but they'll be in a gen ed environment. Being a former English language learner, for the next four years, that child is still tracked to see if is the student continually make progress, progressions or is that child backsliding. So there is a lot of monitoring of our students um, across the board. And of course, it's all individualized. Fortunately, we have uh, uh, assessors in district who are multilingual. And when we don't, Ms. Mendoza goes out and looks at contractors for those who speak um, languages that perhaps our assessors can't address. Thank you, Mr. Barada. Thank, thank you, Mr. Laura. Mr. George? I just want to thank you for that presentation. It brings me back to my first year as a student support specialist walking around Durfee and seeing kids that were misplaced from Puerto Rico, which is part of the U.S. territory. And, you know, they all came to the high school and knew no English, and yet they were expected to take the MCAS and graduation requirements. And at that time, it was probably 2015, I didn't see as many support. So it's nice to hear about this newcomer program in the high school and really trying to address you know, students in those positions so that we can give them the best education we can. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. <coughs> Mr. Vier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barada, for that uh, great presentation. Thank you to Mrs. Mendoza for all her hard work. Um, I know the district's done a few things. We've switched from um, the Remind app to the Square app to help with uh, translation for our multilingual families. I learned at the high school advisory committee there's another program, the PAL program, which is also, also offering support. My question to you is, is there anything else we can do right now to help support families and students, or are we doing pretty much everything we can at this time? That, I would say, I could give you a stock answer that Ms. Mendoza and her team will leave no stone unturned to support the students from meals and access and resources in the community to how best to support the families with the, the attempt of creating a, an LPAC, just like we have a special needs uh, parent group. Uh, Ms. Mendoza has tried to get off the ground now for multiple years in LPAC, English Language Learners Parent Committee, and she's had mixed results, not because of our efforts, but it's trying to build that bridge with families of how to pull them in. Um, but I think that's probably a, a question that could best be answered by Ms. Mendoza, perhaps at another meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vieira. Secretary Fagan? Yeah, I just have one question, Mr. Barada. I'm just curious, if, if a child comes in in kindergarten, you already, you, you, you'll have that in preschool too also? Does it go down that low? All right, so how quickly do you think most kids, do you have any numbers on how quickly they actually Learn the language. It must be easier when they're younger, or that's the wrong assumption. I can take a stab at that. Actually, Mrs. Moynihan and I took an SEI class last year, and I remember there was one piece of the SEI course that really intrigued me. It had to do with how long it takes for a student to be at a proficient level mm -hmm. of English speaking, and I believe it was 19 years. What? Hmm. 19 years. So 19 years. 
for a student who comes in without speaking wow. English to be at a highly proficient conversational reading and writing and speaking. It takes about 19 years of schooling for a student to get to that level. So, but I also think if you look at the chart on slide, I think it was slide nine, I think it articulates the point that Mr. Laura was trying to make, that you see at the elementary school, the students are sponges. So they acquire the language at a much faster rate. And as they get into middle school and they get into high school, you see the numbers decline. And when we get into the budget cycle, when Mrs. Moynihan starts talking about the different sections of funding, we, the state provides additional or more dollars for the older students in the L program because it takes more time, more effort, more work. So depending on when a student comes in to the country mm -hmm. and enters into a multilingual and immersion program, it will depend on how long it will take them to become fully fluent in the English language. And then the only thing that I would add is, it's, this is a quote that I think Mrs. Mendoza or somebody shared during one of our meetings. People often forget that our multilingual learners, they have language, they just don't have the English language yet. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's always something that we need to be very mindful of. Just because a student doesn't speak English doesn't mean they have a learning disability, doesn't mean that they're not intelligent. And sometimes people confuse you know, a student who doesn't speak English or is struggling to acquire English, so they must have a learning disability. They just need more time acquiring and mastering the language. So they take, do they take the, te the, uh, they take the MCAS in their native language? But, uh, or they don't? Now there are some adaptions to the MCAS. I know we have Spanish and such, but not fully reflective of all the languages. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Fagan. So let me uh, just share a quick uh, bit about my history. Uh, growing up in the 60s, born in 64, growing up a predominantly Portuguese neighborhood in New Bedford, living on a third floor apartment, I was that kid that spoke Portuguese within those four walls. And as soon as we left those four walls of the apartment, it was English with my brothers, sister, and friends. And we had the neighborhood where the bakery was Portuguese, the banker was Portuguese, the shoe store was Portuguese, the market was Portuguese, everything was Portuguese. So my father, who wasn't fluent in the Portuguese language till his death, he could speak okay with English and comprehend and so forth, didn't find a necessity to master the English language. And we were the translators back then. My mother, on the other hand, was a little bit different. But, you know, it, it, it goes to show that, you know, sometimes you're, you're, you're thinking in English but speaking in Portuguese or vice versa. So, I mean, these kids at the young age can adapt pretty quickly, as we just saw. And I think it's, uh, it's a testament that uh, kids could have a second language, no matter what that second, lang second language is. It's a, yeah, exactly, Superintendent. It's a superpower. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Superintendent, anything to close? No, because what you just described, Dr. DeMello, is my mother. So my mother to this day, 80 years old, and she can get by purely on Portuguese based on the neighborhood that she resides in back in my hometown of Fall River. So again, it still exists in pockets, and I think at one point, I'm sure Mr. Fiore could give us a history lesson on all the different ethnic groups that occupied this community and predominantly were able to get by speaking their ethnic language. Well, on the other hand, I'm kind of a, an exception to the rule. My mom was 14 when she came to this country and my grandparent my grandfather was 50 and my grandmother was in her 40s and uh, a year here my mother won a citywide essay contest in Fall River she picked it up that fast she and my aunt when they first came over uh, spent a lot of time in the balcony of movie theaters and uh, that, that's how they picked up a, a wide variety of the language and my mother was a sponge who just, just did it, but I know there are so many other people. I think if I were in that situation myself, I'd have a lot of difficulty, but mom plied right through it, and uh, she spoke English better than I do, and I have a lot more education than she did. <laughs> Sure, super and then just in closing, just a reminder to everyone and to everyone at this table and everyone watching at home, we are a comprehensive school system mm -hmm. and all means all. So we are, you know, it's challenging work, it's very hard work, but it's some of the most meaningful work that we accomplish or we take on as a school system. Excellent. Just, Hats off to Ms. Mendoza. Just quickly. Uh, Mr. Laura. Just one more addition in, in what we're speaking about. I came to this country at the age of nine. And I could say, I remember fluently, I could say thank you at the age of nine. And they put us in the classroom for about six months where we interacted in our own language. 
Very little English was spoken in the classroom, but we did it. We may were able to survive the six months. After six months, they put in a regular. They put me, my brothers, my my friends in a regular classroom. No bilingual teachers. You simply had to learn. And it was not. It was the time then. That's how it was. And sure, we survived. We done. We've done well. We've excelled. But the times have come so well that now we offer all these tools and the resources where someone from another country can actually, through the learning process, can acquire the learning capabilities. But at one time, and this, and prior to that, there were people back in you know, the early. Uh, 9, 20th century that just were put into schools without any additional teaching to simply do to survive. That's Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. And uh, before we move on, is there any motions to accept or do we need any of that stuff? Motion, motion to, to accept the report and place it on file. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Eyes have it. Thank you so much. Next up, we have the superintendent's report, Superintendent Cabral. So I'm, I'm not going to read the report that you have in your packet. I'm just going to summarize the key points of the report. So I apologize if you're following, uh, following the report. I'm just going to summarize several bullets for each item. So as Natalie Duncan mentioned earlier, I'm very proud to announce that our very own Taunton High School, Liam Scully, was named a semifinalist for the 2024 National Merit Scholarship Program. The top 1% of U.S. seniors, which equates about 16,000 students nationwide, and Liam Scully is one, is part of that 1%. Based on Liam's academic and extracurricular excellence in the Key Club, the Latin Club, the math team, as well as the jazz band, that all factored in to Liam being recognized as, a, as one of the top 1% the top of seniors in this country. And we are all, as well as Liam and his family, and the staff at Taunton High School, we are all awaiting the next stage of the competition for which 7,140 students will be awarded scholarships totaling $28 million. Next in my report, something that I'm very excited and something that uh, we've been working long and hard, waiting long and hard for at Taunton High School is Taunton High School and Bristol Community College you now are one step closer to receiving an early college designation status. So part A of the application was approved, and Taunton High School has now moved on to part B. What I just found out this week is as they were awarded or told to move on to part B, they were also awarded $50,000 to help with the planning and completion of the sec second part of the application, which they'll do jointly or complete jointly with Bristol Community College. So this enhances uh, post-secondary pursuits for students. This early college designation will result in a liberal arts pathway so students can graduate from Taunton High School, we believe initially with 15 credits, and the goal, the goal will be for students to graduate with a high school diploma as well as a community college degree as well. So this, is, this work is being supported by an early college joint committee, and the final application will be due January 24th, so I'll continue to keep the committee updated. And I just sat, also sat in on a review with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. They only identified two areas that they'd like to see the application improved upon, so we feel very strongly that we are going to receive that early college designation. Taunton High School also was awarded a social and emotional learning grant. So the Taunton Public Schools was awarded a $133,000 social emotional learning grant to support our social emotional learning activities. This can support professional development, this can support curriculum, and as well as other uh, activities that allow us to continue providing a robust social emotional learning environment for our students, as well as our staff, <coughs> as well as our families. And then also want to recognize something that Dr. Cheryl Butts and Amy Kozlowskis, who represent the school department, human resource department, and the city's human resource department, one of the hindrances to quickly bringing on board qualified staff has been the physical requirement, which can sometimes take months, and it also impacts uh, potential employees in the pocket. So we, the city council recently voted to approve that the physical requirement no longer be part of the application process. So we are very excited as that one, it also relieves the financial burden of potential employees. It also 
provides relief to our budget, but more importantly, it also values and prioritizes privacy. And then last but not least, not in the report, I'd be remiss if I didn't share this with you. Uh, I was very proud and very honored on Monday to have Commissioner Jeff Riley from the Department of, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education visit the Martin Middle School on Monday, October 16th. Uh, the, he was only there for an hour, but it was a very powerful hour. The first 30 minutes was spent in a seventh grade science classroom where we got to observe the Open Syed, class, uh, open Syed curriculum with a great group of seventh graders. And then the second half of the hour, roughly 30 minutes, was spent with a 30-minute roundtable discussion. Uh, what I enjoyed most about the 30-minute roundtable discussion that it was student-led, student-centered. I believe there were students, seven students, along with Principal Pereira. We also had members of the district leadership team, the school committee, I'm mayor, and we also had our local, our local, dele our local delegates were also represented. Representative Carol Doherty was present, Representative Norman Oral was present, as well as Senator Mark Pacheco was present. What I took away from the visit was one, our students are amazing. They really performed well in front of a large group of adults. But I also took several key comments uh, from the commissioner, where the commissioner felt that based on what he saw, based on what he heard from our students and those at the table, that we were ahead of most districts coming out of COVID. And he also felt that a lot of the work taking place in Taunton could be used as a model for other school systems to emulate. I know we had some, key, some school committee members who were there. If they'd like to comment or share their thoughts, I, I would welcome you to share your thoughts and your feelings. And I know Chris and Brenda were there. If they want to comment, I welcome them, their comments as well. Sure, so I'll open up to the committee, Mr. Laura. Yeah, I was uh, present as well, and really, what what made me so excited about that that meeting in the round table was the fact that the students held nothing back. They were freely able to speak what their thoughts were. They were very open about it, and uh, the exchange was just superb. It really was a very good experience. Thank you, Mr. Laura. Uh, any comments on the superintendent's report before I make some comments? So uh, if I could just uh, go back to the beginning of the report. Uh, congratulations, Liam. Uh, quite a remarkable accomplishment. Um, going on to the Bristol Community College um, partnership, I think that's exciting too, especially when we're given $50,000 to work on this collaboratively. And the social emotional uh, learning grant, which is, I think, very beneficial to our district. As we all know, we continue to face some challenges, and, uh, but we're going to work them out. I know we're going to work them out as a committee, and we got the support of the superintendent and his leadership team. And if I can now go to the visit of the commissioner, uh, it, it was quite impressive when you have, what, 13 adults going into a seventh grade classroom, and these kids did not skip a beat. Uh, they were studying some pretty interesting stuff, some pretty difficult stuff, <laughs> and uh, there were two or three that uh, always had the answer. And of course, some others that were a little bit hesitant, a little bit shy. But uh, our kids are, are really, really smart. And uh, getting to the round table, I think what uh, what's resonated with me, and this is because of Mrs. Monahan, uh, when we talked about career paths, what they want to be in their careers. Uh, we heard lawyers, we heard police officers, we heard a multitude of different careers. But Mrs. Monahan mentioned after the meeting was done, we didn't hear anybody say being being a teacher. So that's scary. Uh, I, I think that's something we need to work on. Uh, being at a liberal arts university at Bridgewater, that's what we're famous for, right? A teaching college. Uh, I, I think that we need to uh, motivate some students to be teachers. So whatever we can do as a district to make sure that that is a wonderful and rewarding career path, I think that's important. But uh, Mrs. Monahan did point it out and it, and it resonated with me as soon as I left the room that that was very, very uh, observant, you know? So anyway, it was all successful. Um, we were thanked by the commissioner. Uh, the school committee was thanked, thanked us, I should say, as a group for working together and collaboratively in support of the superintendent and leadership team. So thank you to all the committee members for making it work. Just if I could real quickly, Ms. Dr. DeMello, so you'll be happy to know that because of the success of our officiating course, our officiating pathway, after speaking with Mrs. Bonneau and Principal Holcomb at the high school, uh, that is something that they are going to be pursuing as a teacher pathway. Excellent. What are the wishes of the committee? I'm sorry, any comments from Mr. Barada, Mrs. Monahan? 
No. Okay. Uh, what are the wishes of the committee? Motion to accept the report. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Superintendent. Next up, administrative business staffing report. See enclosure. Any comments? Receive in place on file. Oh, Second. Okay. Uh, yep. Whoop. Second on discussion, Secretary Fagan. Um, I just want to say that there is a person with the last name Fagan on here, no relation to me. So, in case somebody I, believes that, I was wondering. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a bunch of boys, I didn't have girls. And um, there's, there's a, a William Callahan who resigned, but it says from her position. Is that just a typo? It's a typo. Are there resignations? Right. Right there. We'll, we'll have it corrected. For okay. The, for the All right. Okay. Uh, anything you. else? Nope. That's uh, it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Next up, we have the Taunton Public School staffing update. Is this different? Uh, it's yes. just, uh, I think this is the report that I've been including that I think goes back to the last year. Mr. I think it was Mr. Pulowski. Well, we raised concerns about where we were with staffing. Oh, okay. So I'm also happy to uh, announce that I received an updated report today. So we had another school at 100% staffed with the classroom teachers. So Chamberlain is now 100% staffed. So we are 90% staffed with regards to our classroom teachers. And I think it was a question that I think Mrs. Fagan raised last week or last meeting. So we've also included a listing of all the positions that we are trying to fill on the back of the uh, staffing report. So if you look at Letty, you'll notice a social worker, behavior intervention counselor, Chamberlain, you can scratch Chamberlain. That position has been filled. At the Galligan School, it's a 0.5, a grade four teacher, which is a job share teacher. Again, social worker, behavior intervention case worker, which will work in the reset space. At Mulcahy School, it's a special educator in the fourth grade. At the Martin Middle School, a substantially separate special educator. At the Parker School, it's a substantially separate special educator, and we had a recent uh, art vacancy. So that position was filled to start the year, but it's now vacant, so we have to fill that. We still, we still struggle to fill the junior ROTC, but Major LaPlante is uh, working with the students, so we do have someone in there. We just need to find him some support. Uh, the high school, we're still working on finding a library media specialist, and then we have three special education positions, one working in the Alerts and Tops program, and then two uh, special educators. And then last but not least, at the district level, we are still looking for one adjustment counselor for the Chamberlain Elementary School, two special educators at the elementary level, and a speech and language pathologist. So we have 16 TEA positions uh, left to be filled. Excellent. Mr. Vieira. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple <coughs> questions for Superintendent. Is it possible that we um, can add a column, that way we can make a comparison from what it was at the prior meeting, that way I don't have to shuffle through my paperwork it's a pile of it on my desk thank you the other question um in the staff room report are the the current resignations reflected in these numbers or they are based on based so the report uh, my priority has always been making sure we have educators in front of students and that's what this report reflects certified licensed educators in front of students so the staffing report is reflected as of today thank you superintendent thank you Secretary Fagan. Um, Mr. Cabral, the, some of these positions like special educators, who's covering that now? So, so we- uh, how, how are you managing that? Because that's, them. excuse me? <laughs> my wife is doing the one in Mulcahy. So we either bring in uh, licensed staff to cover the classrooms as subs, or long-term subs, and we also have language in the collective bargaining agreement where special educators can plan and provide supports until we have somebody full-time in the position. So the buildings arrange for the coverage <coughs> to make it work. I'm trying to think of the contract. At some point when they get to a certain amount of days, that this does the salaries go up? Is that was one of those If things? you are a substitute in the position, and I forget the number of days, I think it's 60 or 45. Once you're in 60 consecutive or 45 consecutive days, don't quote me on the number of days, you do go step and track, correct? That's what I thought, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Fagan. Yeah. Uh, so the word is out. Uh, come join Taunton Public Schools. We'd love to have you. For anybody at home that's listening or has uh, someone that wants to be, is interested. Thank you. Uh, what are the wishes of the committee? Motion to accept the report. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Next up, we have the Taunton Public School District Enrollment Update. See enclosure. 
I yeah, just want to provide you with a quick update. And, and again, once we submit the October 1 report, I will not. I will just provide you with the final number mm -hmm. for the October 1 report. And then on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis, I'll provide you with where we stand <coughs> as far as enrollment. So as of 10-12-2023, we saw an increase of 15 students from the previous meetings. So at the last time I presented you with this report, <coughs> we had 8,165 students. We now have 8,180 students. And I also want to mention that in the Taunton Public Virtual Academy, we have reached 50 students. So that 50 students equates to $800,000 in Chapter 70 funding mm -hmm. that we are retaining in the city of Taunton. So that program is already paying for itself and then some. So I want to commend the committee for your hard work and for supporting the vision of providing one more resource, one more outlet, or one more opportunity for students to attend school in the Taunton Public Schools. Thank you. And if uh, members would remember, the virtual school was capped at 75, I believe. The cap was 75, but I think at this rate, we may be appealing to the state for a, a higher number. Good. Mm -hmm. So we're on the right track. That's all positive. Thank you, Superintendent. Wishes of the committee on the enrollment update. It's even placed on file. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Next up, we have subcommittee reports. First, High School Subcommittee Chairman Pawlowski. Uh, thank you, Dr. DeMello. On Wednesday, October 11th, 2023, we had two um, meetings of the high school subcommittee. Um, these were meetings of the Taunton High School Student Advisory and the Taunton Alternative High School Student Advisory. Uh, these were great, very successful meetings. Uh, so first at three o'clock, we met at Taunton High School. Uh, myself, Mr. Vieira, Mrs. Fagan uh, of the high school subcommittee were in attendance. Also in attendance, John Cabral, Chris Barada, Scott Holcomb, Carolyn Blano, and Jason Torres from Taunt High. And the student representatives were Leticia Lopes and Kaylee Sanchez from the 12th grade, Natalie Duncan, who gave the great report earlier today, and Julia Mendonca from the 11th grade, Lainey Murphy, Isaiah Wendell, and Leanna Mora from the 10th grade, and Jessica and Denzel Chukwu from the 9th grade. So they gave us a lot of input on uh, what they thought was going well and, and they've seen improvements at the high school. And they also gave us input on what they thought we could improve. So I've summarized um, their general um, uh, wishes for improvement or opportunities for improvement into distinct uh, action items that we referred to the administration. So I'll, I'll read those right now. So number one, um, they saw as an issue with student behavior in the hallways in between classes, uh, <coughs> mostly seen with the younger students. Um, number two is food at the school. So the lunches and the breakfast and specifically um, fries, burgers, nuggets, chicken patties being cold, soggy, whatnot. Um, second, not a lot of healthy options. Uh, third, breakfast lines too long in the morning. Uh, and then fourth, running out of food at sixth lunch. So they have six lunches at Taunton High School, which seems crazy to me. But yeah, lunch number one starts at 9.57 a.m. and lunch number six starts at 11.37. Um, so I'm happy to hear from Natalie's report that it sounds like in response to this meeting, the administration at uh, Taunton High is already taking action on some of these. Um, the third option was uh, the students uh, reported that they wish to see an improvement in the respect that the students are giving to teachers. And they had a couple of great ideas on ways that they could, they could work on that. Um, and then finally, uh, the students wish for a, a better cell phone use policy. So this is the thing that's been worked on um, by the, the schools and the district over the years. Um, and uh, we, we, can, we can hope for continuous improvement. Um, but on the, so those are the things we need to work on, but the things that the kids said are going well. Um, they said they feel really great about the new weapons detection system. Um, the students are adjusting to it. They're passing through it faster, but they, they feel a sense of safety having this at their school. Uh, so that's good to hear. Um, they see the impact of all the additional security guards that we've hired for the school. They see them forming positive relationships with the students walking around. Uh, they see the impact of, of the security guards and the administrators and the teachers checking the restrooms, especially during lunches, uh, making sure that students are getting to class. So that's our prime example of last year when we had this meeting, one of the biggest points of concerns of these children were the bathrooms and the fact that, they, that many of them were locked. The ones that were open, they couldn't get in because they were just 
tons of kids should have been in class. They're not seeing that now. Kids are seeing that they can leave class, go to the restroom, do what they need to do, get back to class. So that's really important. And like, big, big uh, round of applause to the, the, the people at Taunton High and, and the district for, for making these improvements, uh, but mostly to these kids for speaking up, having their voices heard, and then seeing the impact of it. Um, Let's see, they, the uh, bathrooms have much improved, they said that. Uh, they feel like things are improving every year at Taunton High School. Um, oh, uh, so uh, Mr. Vieira mentioned it earlier, but uh, Leticia Lopes spoke to us about the, uh, the PALS program um, in which they're helping newcomers come along. So an experienced student of that language would meet up with a newcomer of the same language, get together with them, teach them about uh, all the different uh, clubs and after school uh, opportunities for them, sports and whatnot. So uh, she was really proud of it in, 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 the, in the work that they had done. So that, that was great to hear. Um, and additionally, they spoke about um, the Tigers Together program in which older students are helping younger students come along and they made the connection right in the meeting that perhaps a lot of the, you know, misbehaving and, and, and not acting right in the hallways are due to a lot of the younger students who haven't really like learned the ropes yet and they can, they're going to try to kind of use that Tigers Together thing to, you know, help the younger kids come along and, you know, act the the Taunton Highway, so that was that was really great to hear. Um, they also gave um, real praise for the college fairs that we've been putting on, and uh, have just particularly noticed that student involvement is like at an all-time high this year. So, uh, really can't appreciate enough these these kids' involvement, and we we hope to see this going on. So that was just the first meeting. Second meeting at 4.30, we met over at the Taunton Alternative High School. Uh, same attendance, myself, Mr. Vieira, Mrs. Fagan, Jean Cabral, Chris Barada, and Kevin Brennan from the uh, Alternative High School were, were there. Uh, we met with two uh, 12th grade students, Tyree Hendren and Ladyana Martinez. Um, so, th you know, they, they spoke so glowingly of their experiences at this school, um, how valued they felt. They felt every day when they came in, they knew that every single administrator and teacher in that building really cared about them and cared about their success. Um, you know, they spoke about the struggles they had at Taunton High School being a much larger uh, environment. And uh, you know, for various reasons, they were re recommended to Taunton Alternative High School, and they've really seen the improvement. And you know, one of the students really mentioned that before they came to the Taunton Alternative High School, they never envisioned themselves even graduating, much less going to college. But now they have, uh, you know, very very clear career paths. Um, so. Yeah, and, and they're, they're really the only point of concerns that the students have was if we are to expand that, the enrollment at that school in any way, they want to make sure that we're going to accordingly hire more teachers because they really see the value in the small student to teacher ratio and they want to make sure that we, we maintain that. So um, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything because it gives us a lot of uh, good, good input, but uh, yeah, just you know, uh, really, really moved by the 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 input and the involvement of of these students, and they really care about their schools, and they really take advantage of this opportunity to come and pr present to the high school and present you know before their administrative that what they think is great, what they think needs to improve, and uh, we will support them moving forward. Thank you, Chairman Pawalski. Very comprehensive report. I'll open up to the subcommittee first. Mr. Vieira, any comments? No, I just want to say that um, it was really great to be able to see the, um, the hard work that's been put in by Taunton Public Schools to address those issues that we all get calls about and we all hear about the bathrooms, the vaping, school security. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's been a major improvement and it was very gratifying. And I also want to say that Mr. Pulowski really did a great job of taking what my kids would call the filet cut out of both of those meetings and expressing them because you really hit on every, every uh, important topic that was discussed. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Vieira. Uh, Secretary Fagan, any comments from the subcommittee meetings? No, I, uh, we had a 
I think we had a terrific time. I really enjoyed sitting with the students and just sharing a lot of things. Uh, the only thing we did talk about is I had asked one of that girl about block scheduling and she really didn't like it. And then you said, geez, we, should, we, did, we forgot to ask the high school kids if they were comfortable with the block schedule. Remember that conversation we had? And one of the things I had said to, to Nate when we were there, I said, you know, I felt bad when, when you realized the frustration the kids had with that. It was always something we were worried about when we instituted that program. And um, she said uh, th that it was just too long for her, you know? And I thought, and I said to him, you know, if you're not happy sitting in a class that long, you, got, you know that after you go with the first one, you still have three more of those real long classes. But a lot of the stuff we talked about way back when we did this, because it was a trendy thing and everybody was doing it, they thought they would get enough material, you know, they'd get enough of the subject. And you, you, you said something about some teachers never figured out how to get a year into a half a year. And I said, who could? So inevitably, you did lose stuff, which is all the stuff that, you know, that both uh, Mr. Holcomb and, and Kristen Keenan had presented to us. All those things kind of came to fruition. So I, I'm glad we're on mm -hmm. track, and at least we can correct things that they weren't quite right. But I think the kids seem happy with it. Thank you. Uh, just one comment, Mr. Polsky. So on the cell phone uh, policy that they refer to, uh, is there anything that we need to take immediate action on or consider? Uh I, I think just in general, you know, these are these are the action items that arose from the the, the students' uh, concerns. So these have been, uh, you know, referred to the administration, um, and it sounds like they're already working on a lot of it. The the cell phone use policy, they have a policy. Right. Um, it's implemented, and even the students that that had kind of issues with it, they see the value of it, but they're they're wondering if. Could we have continuous improvement on it and maybe consider what parts of the current policy work well, what parts don't work so well, uh, you know, for various reasons. So I think it's, sure. it's, it's been heard by the administration, uh, Superintendent Cabral and team will, will take it from there. Sure. I mean, I just appreciate a recommendation moving forward since we are responsible for policy, right? Uh, whatever you think is best, Superintendent Cabral, we'd definitely like to hear. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one because I personally I never liked being punished because of the because of a small group I, I always felt that we try to educate and try to teach all our kids on the proper use of cell phones mm -hmm. so what we're looking at uh, what we're what's being looked at is how to address individual cell phone abuse so if a student is misusing their cell phone you know, we're looking at technology or maybe looking at a way to address it individually versus impacting the whole group. And I think that's where Isaiah was getting at. I, like most, like I can sit here for two hours and not look at my phone. Whereas some kids, some adults, you know, can't mm. go 30 seconds without looking at their phone. So we wanna make sure that we provide kids with the supports and have the ability to you know, handle individual cases. And I think the only thing I was gonna comment, Mr. Plusky, that you missed, which is a no cost program, but huge benefits and the alternative high school raved about it was junior achievement. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, how they talked about how that program, one, I think it was one of the, I think it was Lidiana, talked about how that program has really inspired her and really, and Tyree, because they were on the, they were on the team, that, act, the entrepreneur team, and how that has really helped them become connected and be engaged. And again, these are free programs that we're taking advantage of. So I just want, want to make sure that was added. I know you, you know somebody oh. who serves on that board? <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, it is in the report as well. And, and again, and uh, I got to thank uh, Mr. Cabral because he took all the notes. So he, he took much better no comprehensive notes uh, than I took. Uh, but yes, that, that's right. Uh, both Lady Anna and Tyree are members of the Junior Achievement. And that, that's one of the things that was, that's a program that, although it's, a, it's, it's offered at Taunton High School as well, they never felt like that's something that they could be a part of at Taunton High School when they came here and they're in a more com comfortable environment. That was the thing that they gravitated to right right away. And, and then they're just like really taking that and running with it. And uh, that, that was a big source of pride for those two students. So uh, thank you for, for reminding me of that. And uh, yeah, so thanks. Sure. Mr. Vieira. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Cabral, not to put you on the hot seat, but the food services seems to be a, a continued issue. Is there anything that we're doing to address that? I know we heard his presentation about how he's checking all the boxes, but 
it doesn't sound like we're getting results by by just checking boxes. So. Yeah, so I, I have some thoughts uh, that I'll share with Mrs. Moynihan on how we can, uh, when we meet with the group again, measure if there has been improvement. So um, I'll connect with Mrs. Moynihan, she'll follow up with the food service director. I, I believe there needs to be some type of quality control, uh, some type of quality control measures where you know, we're assessing or checking the food before it goes out to make sure that it's consistently being cooked to the standard that we expect at each of the lunches <coughs> and also making sure when I hear six lunches and we're running out of food, that's concerning when we have 20, 100 kids, 60% of our students, you know, 60% of our students that's and sometimes is the only meal or sometimes the most nutritious meal they receive. So I want to make sure that all our kids you know, have access to high quality meals because the work that we did during COVID, you know, I think we served over 600,000 meals during COVID. So now that we got our kids in the building, I want to make sure that they continue to receive you know, the nutritious meals throughout the day. And something else that I thought about too, sorry to belabor the point, but once you guys give me a mic, I can't stop talking. Maybe it's something we need to look at the high school because of six lunches. Something that we implemented at the middle school level, and again, I don't know how it translates to a high school with 20, 100 kids, but maybe we look at embedded snack time, working snacks for kids who are eating early so they have an opportunity to have a nutritious snack before the end of the day. So that's mm -hmm. something that I'll explore with uh, Principal Holcomb and Assistant Principal Bonneau. I like that. <coughs> Mr. Thank, thank you, Superintendent, for uh, answering the question. It was very detailed. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. George. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, going back to the cell phone policy piece, I would recommend that we just um, explore maybe the yonder pouches, where it's like a pouch where students are able to have their cell phone in it, but it's a magnet that shuts it, so they're unable to access their phone unless they bring it to the administrator that may have that, the magnet that opens it. So if we have kids that are frequently you know, not following the rules and we don't want to you know, make other students have to put their phones away, we can explore this yonder pouch, which they currently use at the school I'm working at. And, there's no problem like the kids come in they know the expectation they put their phones away when they need to use it they come to us they express why they need to use it what's the reason and we let them use it if it makes sense and if not we request that they go back to class and do what they got to do so great thank you thank you uh, i um i really want to pick up on the snack piece because someone that eats lunch at what 9 57 in the morning and you don't leave until what 2 2 2 10 in the afternoon i think that's a great idea superintendent <laughs> I think we should. Those are all the kids that were coming back for the sixth lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that could be. But anyway, no, I think it's something that, you know, we need to think about. And, you know, we're here collectively thinking about it and let's have some action on it. So thank you for bringing that up. Again, after we analyze the potential impact in a building of that size. But mm. the way we structured it was a working snack, not a full cost right. meal with silverware and fine, and fine china and linens. It's a working snack. Mm. Great. What are the wishes of the committee on uh, Chairman Pawalski's report? Motion to accept the report. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Next up, we have the Elementary Subcommittee, Chairman Laura. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the subcommittee met this evening, uh, present with Mr. Palowski, Mr. George, and myself. And we had two presentations on the school improvement prioritization uh, by Principal Gagnon and pa Principal Kelleher from the um, the Galligan School, Mrs. Gang, Ms. Gagnon, and Mr. Keller from the Bennett Elementary School. And both of them spoke of the priorities of their particular facilities. And uh, the priorities were basically that all educators, particularly in grades two <coughs> through four, will have a clear understanding of grade level writing standards and demands are demonstrated through the consistent implementation of the rubrics and the exemplars. And in this, they speak of the categories which they would pre <coughs> uh, bring these priorities to. And through analysis and strengths of the challenges of the programs, they would speak about the stockholder engagement. And if we have the time, I, I could break this down further for the report, but what, is, what are your wishes? I'll leave it up to the committee. Do you want me to break it down? But basically, they came down with outcomes of what they wanted to do. And so, again, analysis and strengths of these challenges. They would speak about the stockholder engagement. And this would involve students, families, educators, and community leaders to inform how this priority would, would lead on itself. Then you go into outcomes. 
and this, for, this is for accountability of the programs of the specific targets they are meeting in reference to MCAS, in reference to assessments and so forth. Additional data, you'd have student perceptions of their ability based on surveys, and then it went to role clarity as to what the, the strategy would ensure that the stakeholders would fully understand the priority. On priority number two, you have the district. The district is developing strength in tier one of social and emotional systems of support to address the needs of our students and their families and our educators. And again, subcategories of purpose, accountability, role, outcomes, etc. A very, very, very constructive meeting, a lot of information, and uh, we just thank them for their dedication and how they will implement their overall views and priorities. And that concludes the report. Thank you, Chairman. Laura, any comments from the committee? Questions? What are the wishes of the committee? We accept the report and adopt the recommendations. Sorry. Is there a second? Mr. Polsky, you seconded that? Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Chairman Laura. Next up, we have Finance and Law Subcommittee, Chairman Fury. Thank you, Dr. Mello. Um, the Finance and Law Subcommittee met this evening with myself and Dr. DeMello. Our uh, first item was review of uh, use of facilities. It was primarily uses by uh, scouting groups that are reimbursed by community service by the troops uh, for the school system. Then uh, we reviewed the update on uh, special education legal services uh, for the for the month of August 2023, it was $928.90. Dr. DeMello caught a mathematical uh, error in the balance of the account. It's because they forgot to take the August uh, figure out. The, it, the balance that's shown is the, is the balance after July. I went and calculated it. Um, then. Uh, Anyways, uh, the expense was $928.90. Total uh, for the year expended so far was $1357.90. Then uh, Mrs. Moynihan uh, presented uh, budget updates, uh, quarterly budget updates on uh, first our regular appropriations, then the revolving accounts, and then the grants. Uh, Mr. Cabral noted that the um, revolving account is probably going to be showing a, a balance of about six million dollars and he's hoping to come back to the committee with uh, finally funding plans that we've had for some time now for renovations to the softball field and some other athletic facilities that needed upgrading then uh, we had bills payable warrants first for the for fiscal 23 in the amount of $30,315.70 and fiscal 24 in the amount of $947,450.47. And then uh, finally we had a facilities update from our uh, director of facilities. Uh, most of the work that needs to be done by the school department itself uh, has been completed. There are some items that still need to be completed through the city's building department, but they are in the works. And then the committee adjourned. Thank you, Chairman Fury. What are the wishes of the committee? Mo motion to accept the report and adopt the recommendations of the Finance and Law Subcommittee. Second. On discussion, Secretary Fagan. Yes, on um, page, sorry, page 10, warrant number, voucher number 2126Z. That is a Fagan I'm related to. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to vote present on that particular item, part, part if of that's the, okay. Part of the motion with the report. Ex Thank you. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Chairman Fury. Next up, we have uh, new business. We have Unit A Subcommittee, Joint Labor Management Committee. That meeting will take place uh, Wednesday, October 25th at 4 p.m. On that subcommittee is myself, Secretary Fagan, and Mr. Laura. Correct? Mm -hmm. So we have no conflicts with that, I believe. No. We're good with that? Yep. <coughs> okay, great. Next up, we have unfinished business action items updates. <coughs> First and foremost, 
Uh, Lance Corporal Raymond LaPointe dedication update, Superintendent Cabral. All right, just a quick update. I want to keep the committee informed that I will, I'll be meeting with our veterans to finalize the rendering. And so once we, have the, uh, the, once we have their approval on the rendering, we will uh, get it costed out and get an anticipated arrival installation day and then schedule the dedication. Excellent. Thank you, Superintendent. Next up, we have the James L. Mulcahy Library dedication update. Uh, for the community at home that will take place on Saturday, November 4th at 10 a.m. Uh, this is a public event. We invite everyone to come to the ceremony at 10. They will then be followed by an open house at 11 a.m. I know that Mrs. Fagan will be cooking some blueberry muffins for all of us. Is that correct, Mrs. Fagan? Oh, and sorry. brownies as well. Wrong event. Wrong event. Sorry. That's the uh, Old Colony History Museum on uh, Saturday. Uh, but uh, seriously, all members are invited. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be a real special ceremony for th three distinguished educators that had an impact on many students in the city of Taunton. So uh, well, I'm sure it's going to be announced on the website. <coughs> I'm sure the city will have it on their post. And of course, uh, invitations are going out. And uh, I welcome anybody to be in attendance. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? <clears throat> Seeing none. Uh, next up, we have the Tom Public Schools Manic Community Health <coughs> Ribbon Cutting. That's taking place on Friday, November 3rd at 10 a.m. And Superintendent Cabral, could you elaborate a, a li little bit more about that, please? Uh, just very excited. And uh, I, this is something I shared with the commissioner on Monday. He thought it was a great use of our ESSA dollars to provide the community or half the district with a community-based health center. I mean, I cannot say enough about our partnership with Manit Health, you know, the work that they are doing in the district with our students as well as our newcomers. So again, this is also a community event and I'll get the final, I'll provide you with the final details as far as where the uh, assembly will be held. And then there will be food provided, some light refreshments and a tour of the facility. Uh, we're hoping it'll be fully completed but it I, we, we're not sure if it'll be hundred percent completed but it should be completed to the point where you can get a visualization on what to expect and get a quick tour of the facility so again very excited uh, I don't think there are many school systems in Bristol County that have a community-based health center and I believe this will be a model that others uh, can follow or others can can model in their district excellent superintendent so again once again Friday November 3rd 10 a.m. the public is invited to be present to take uh, a look at the uh, health Center. Uh, next up, we have the Long Range Planning uh, Subcommittee, uh, Hopewell Future Use. That is for discussion by Chairman Vieira, correct? Yes, thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Long Range Planning Subcommittee uh, will be scheduling a meeting on uh, October 30th to discuss the future of Hopewell School. I know Mr. Freitas has been uh, gathering information and details on that, so we can uh, have a robust discussion. We'll also be talking about Kohanit School awning and the Taunton High School athletic plan and possibly the LED sign at the high school. Wonderful. We'll, we'll wait to determine whether that's gonna make the agenda or not. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman Vieira, October 3rd, do you have a time yet? Yes, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. 10.30 at 5 p.m. Excellent, thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Doctor. And next up, uh, we do have the Taunton High School LED sign update, C enclosures. Uh, Superintendent Cabral. Yeah, just wanted to provide you with a, you know, one of the quotes that Mr. Mr. Jakes has received. He did reach out to the vendor who installed the original sign, and they provided two quotes for a smaller model, which is four by eight, which is about $22,000. And there was a larger model, which is five by eight, which goes for about 25,000. Uh, Mr. Jakes did receive a second quote, and uh, we'll do our best to get a third quote, you know, hopefully get a response for a third quote. So no action is needed, but the only action I would ask is to give us a budget. So, and I think a budget range would be not to exceed $30,000. I think we can get this work done for under 30,000. So if the committee would like to make a motion to authorize us to complete this work uh, and bring it back to the committee, Know what we're recommending not to exceed thirty thousand dollars if it does exceed thirty thousand dollars then we will ask that the committee you know uh, consider uh, raising that bar um, and I think that's the only action I would like to see if someone would like to make a motion secretary Fagan <clears throat> I have a question is that sign completely kaput believe it or not um, I don't want to put mr. Jakes on the spot but yes it's becoming very difficult to maintain uh, so it is not functioning at this point. What's also difficult about that sign, that sign, that sign is almost 14 years old. Okay. So, and that sign, in order for Mr. Jakes 
to change the sign, he has to plug in with a device and change it manually. These new signs are all Wi-Fi based, so he can okay. actually change it anywhere there's Wi-Fi signal. Did something get in there that destroyed that electrical thing? I know we had a problem at the baseball field with the sign that we had that used to be a scoreboard. That got all wet and everything. I don't know. There's a lot of water around here. I don't believe. I believe it's just <laughs> natural wear and tear. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. For you. Mr. Vieira. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How are we going to pay for it? Good, great question. So my my suggestion, uh, I know we just did a budget update, and I know some of the some of the uh, lines are over budget. I would say we charge it to the appropriation, and then when we get to the end of the year, which is usually around April, if we have some lines with a surplus, we would make the necessary transfers to balance it. So I would say we charge it to the appropriation, knowing that when Mrs. Moynihan closes out the budget, we'll balance out the lines to make sure we don't go over budget. Thank you. Uh, I, I just have a comment. I mean, one of my biggest pet pet peeves being on a school community is driving into Taunton High and that sign not being functioning and the superintendent knows I have been very vocal about that. Uh, I think it's it's going to serve our students. <coughs> it's going to showcase our students. It's going to showcase the accomplishments for school choice especially. We keep talking about school choice and how much money is generated from school choice. Uh, I, I mean it's just, it's just a win-win. Uh, the technology has changed. I mean Secretary Fagan asked a valid question what was technology 14 years ago, physically going up and plugging in a mm -hmm. keyboard to make some changes, doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, and I know that one of the bids included a leasing option, so we could explore that too. So we'll bring that all to the committee. We'll put our thinking caps on, like we always do, and make the best decision. But I think it's instrumental that we have that sign. I mean, we have a beautiful scoreboard at the football field, but yet we don't have a welcoming sign <coughs> for our parents, our students, and of course our guests. So. More to be discussed. Thank you. Next up, we have the action item update. Oh, I'm sorry. A motion would a be motion. in order. I would so motion that. To so up the to motion 30, would 000. be to explore. Okay, but to come before that, could we amend to put come before the committee with some recommendations? Okay, so that's part of the motion, Mr. Lohr, with the recommendations. That the amount be up to thirty thousand. Right. The superintendent comes back, makes a recommendation to us. This is what we can do it for up to 30000 Excellent. Second. Second by Mr. George. Mr. Fury. And uh, speaking as a 69-year-old nearsighted man, I would prefer the larger size sign if we could possibly <laughs> arrange it. I think we can get a big bang for the buck for 30000 Absolutely. So the motion's on the floor. Uh, there's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Superintendent. Next up, action item update. Any action on the list in front of us? Yep. Secretary Fagan. Solar on the schools to committee of the whole, that's already been um, sent to the superintendent's uh, office. To so that was referred, that I believe, that. on October 4th. Yeah, referred to him, so. Okay, so uh, motion will be in order to remove the yes. refer solar on schools to committee of the whole. Remove is the uh, motion by Secretary Fagan. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Anything else, Secretary Fagan or no. committee okay. members? Nope. Uh, press time. I don't see any press in the audience. Do you want to take the library dedication off? Uh, not until it's done. I'm, I'm one of those superstitious people that I like That's to. That's why the inoperable sign's saying, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, press time, although I get quite a few questions from the press that they're going to be here. Um, they're not here tonight, so that's okay. But we're always really willing to take calls. And uh, I guess this is our last meeting for the month of October. Uh, be well, everybody. See you at the next subcommittee meeting, and have a great weekend. And motion to motion adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Good night. Thank you.